Well, with that, welcome everybody to this special event, a collaboration of multiple organizations, the future of public engagement in a hybrid world. As I mentioned, you're coming in muted, but that's only for this moment to eliminate background noise to kick us off. If you can have your cameras on, that would be much appreciated. I will now be handing it off to Sarah Rubin to kick us off. Sarah. Thank you, Pooja. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. It's so exciting to already look um, at who is participating to see so many people I know. Um, so welcome. My name is Sarah Rubin. I am the Chief Outreach and Engagement Advisor at the California Department of Conservation. And as I go over our agenda in the next minute or two, I'm gonna ask everyone to right now, click the chat function, open it up and share with us where you are participating from. So tonight is about this new world we are all struggling with. How do we do hybrid engagement? And we have an incredibly ambitious agenda. This could easily be three days worth of content but we're just doing a little bite at the apple tonight. So I'm gonna go over our agenda and I'm gonna jump right in because we want as much time as possible for dialogue and connecting with each other. So here is what we have planned. In a moment, I'm gonna hand things over for our partners to say hello. We have Kobe, our keynote, ready to go. I'm so excited about it. Then we're gonna do a quick breakout a small breakout that's really about what brings you here tonight? Why did you decide to participate? Then we've got our speakers, Miguel and Rebecca, and then we're gonna go into a breakout and we are gonna do all that and finish by 6.30. So um, use the chat function, participate along, and I'm gonna go ahead and hand things right over to Maureen so we can jump in. Thank you so much, Sarah. I agree with you. It's so exciting to be here and see so many names and faces that I recognize. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Maureen Tobin. I'm the new executive director of the Davenport Institute for Public Engagement and Civic Leadership, where we focus on building stronger communities by promoting and supporting public participation in local government. I am truly delighted to be um, here collaborating with these other organizations that partnered together to bring uh, this evening to all of you. I, I sincerely believe that when we collaborate and partner, the communities that we serve ultimately benefit. And that's a really good thing. So enjoy the evening and I'm excited to share and learn with you. And I don't know if Kristen Wyatt from ELGL is on. Is Kirsten on? We want to thank ELGL for partnering with us as well. And if Kirsten is not here, then I'm going to introduce to you Kathy Smith with IAP2. Thank you, Kathy. It's not a meeting until somebody talks uh, on the mute, right? So I just did that. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Kathy Smith from San Diego. I am the immediate past president of IAP2 USA board, and I've provided public participation through my own consulting practice the last 25 years. Um, this conversation, I'm really excited about this conversation too. It's so important to the IAP2 USA goals of advocating for quality public participation and building a community that reinforces that quality and developing a whole culture that understands and supports public participation as fundamental to our country's success and a crucial path to creating a more equitable world. So on behalf of IEPT USA and many of our board members that are here tonight, um, we wanna thank you for spending time together here tonight and advancing these goals together. Um, with that, I will toss it over to Julia, I believe, over at the Institute of Local Government. Great, thank you. Welcome everyone. We're really excited to see so many faces here. And um, I wanted to introduce myself. So I'm with the Institute for Local Government. 
Uh, my name is Julia Salinas, and I'm the Senior Manager of Equity and Public Engagement. And so for those of you that don't know who ILG is, uh, we are the nonprofit affiliate for the League of California Cities, the California State Association of Counties, and the California Special Districts Association. So we really have our hands throughout California at the local government level. Um, our goal is really, our mission is to help local government leaders navigate complexity, increase capacity, and build trust in their communities. And we offer a range of services from education, training, technical assistance, capacity building, working across a lot of different program areas, such as leadership and governance, civics education and workforce, public engagement, and sustainable communities. Um, I also wanted to share very briefly, um, September 9th and 10th, we have our upcoming public engagement training, which will be virtual. So a two-day training that really goes through the public engagement framework that we've developed. And as a chance for our local government um, staff from across California to come together, um, to talk about public engagement, the challenges, the successes, um, what you're facing, um, you know, trying to work together and creating a learning cohort going forward as well. Um, so, so check out our, our website for that upcoming training. Thanks, everyone. And the next person who will be speaking is Kit Cole. Thank you, Kit. <laughs> You're welcome, Maureen. Hi, everybody. It's really, really good to see you. I get to introduce my friend Kobe. He's in a beautiful, tiny green and blue office. I always think he looks like he's underwater. I met Kobe through the um, Davenport Institute Certificate Program and um, immediately was just blown away by him, by his perspective, by his brilliant by his kindness and his humanity. He is um, a big supporter of IAP2, of Davenport, of ELGL, um, of uh, local government folks as well. Uh, he has been there and experienced it. So Kobe, we cannot wait to hear what you have to say. You're sort of our informal keynote. So go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Kid. And I'm gonna share my screen here and please let me know if that does not uh, appear for you all here. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, be in this, what I call a community of practice of folks who in various ways, and there's a lot of overlap, do good work for our community. Uh, for me, it really doesn't matter what your, your title is per se, what the name of your organization is. It's ultimately, for me, it's all about the work. And uh, uh, really thankful and appreciative of sharing this space with you all uh, this evening. Uh, greetings from Ohio. I'm Kobe, I'm, uh, the principal and founder of New Reach Community Consulting. And I'll uh, introduce what I call the state of engagement for the context of our conversation this evening. Just a little bit about me. Um, I am a proud activist, advocate, and organizer. Um, that's something that I know might be a little jarring depending on the uh, communities. I think largely dependent on privilege and power. However, it has origins in a lot of the uh, religions, the holidays, and uh, some of the statues we're working on others, um, and you know that that we and the rites that we honor and that we practice. So I'm, I'm very proud to be a drop in that ocean, that mighty ocean. I also have a background in legislative affairs, liaised with uh, various policymakers and electeds on the local, state, and federal level. Um, I'm also a techie. Uh, that was actually the only other career I've had was in information technology, both in the private sector and proudly as a uh, prior service US Navy. So although I've never been a staff member of a uh, civilian government, I do have a uniform hanging in my closet and I did IT uh, as, as my job uh, in, in the service. And I'm a consultant. Um, again, I'm the owner and founder of New Reach Community Salt Consulting. And I specialize in helping organizations connect important causes to the community. And I specifically focus on social impact, which for me are things that ultimately help to change, improve, and sometimes even save lives. So uh, start with some definitions here. Community engagement and yeah, I know, okay, Wikipedia, right? Well, you know, the interesting thing is that no one really owns the definition. It's really a combination of two different words. And I'll read this definition uh, according to Wikipedia. It's a dynamic relational process that facilitates communication, interaction, involvement, and exchange between an organization and a community for a range of social and organizational outcomes. 
hopefully a lot of that sounds familiar. It sounds pretty on point to me. One thing that really resonates with me is that the definition does not specify any particular method or tactic. It's really about connections and it's about the community. So what I propose, you know, when I, when I hear hybrid, um, really to me, that's an acknowledgement that we're no longer viewing online engagement as being secondary or an add-in option. Uh, the fact of the matter is that it's always been an option on the table. Uh, it's just kind of getting reprioritized uh, due to a few factors that I'll just briefly touch on here uh, during our time this evening. So, you know, here's a few inconvenient truths about uh, the general categories that our work typically falls within. In terms of in-person engagement, I believe that there has historically been an over-reliance on what I call be there or be square events. Um, you know, be at the building on the random Tuesday at 12.35 p.m. And that's where you really get all of the juicy information that we want to share with communities. Um, am I suggesting that uh, that should go away? No, and that's not realistically true. In many cases, that's a, uh, it's a compliance uh, um, operation. However, that is ultimately a means to an end. Um, that is a, many times it's a milestone. It's one of the many methods that we can engage with communities. If we're being honest, it predominantly caters to the privileged and the powerful. To be more specifically, um, those settings are generally very white, they're very, uh, they're older, and they're fairly wealthy. So white, older, and wealthy. Boston University actually has an interesting uh, case study on that that they uh, uh, conducted a couple of years ago that illustrates that. Um, and it misses the movable middle. That's a term that I borrowed from the uh, political space. I do not touch candidates. I work on issues specifically. Um, but, you know, oftentimes in-person engagements attract people who really like you or what you're doing or really don't like you or really don't like what you're doing. Uh, what about everyone else? You know, there's, it, we really, um, there's an opportunity to get that, that sweet spot. I love Venn diagrams, so it's like a Venn diagram with a, a whole lot of overlap. That predominantly overlap are people who are the movable middle, who um, there's an opportunity to engage with those that doesn't always happen with purely engagement, um, in-person engagement. Um, now I'll touch on online engagement. It doesn't necessarily unto itself empower new people, not if you're not intentional about it, not if you're not thoughtful about it. If anything, you can just shift those, uh, the, the privilege and the powerful that I mentioned before into those online environments. And we see that playing out um, rapidly online now. Um, tech itself is just a tool and any tool is just as good as what you use it for and maybe what it was even intended to be used for. So by no means is it a, a silver bullet. Additionally, some of the uh, inconvenient uh, truths with uh, online engagement is the digital divide, which I'll unpack here on the next slide. Don't have time to completely unpack this. Uh, this is, I uh, wanted to touch on a few things. This is actually a recent study that uh, Pew Research Center conducted earlier this year, and I think just released a few weeks ago. And it's kind of a high level overview of the digital divide. So yes, I think most of us know that generally speaking, it falls along socioeconomic factors. A uh, couple of things that I wanna point out though. One is that historically the digital divide had spoken to purely access. So quite literally, do you have a computer? Uh, yes, I'm old enough to remember the gray, the gray and beige desktop tower computers and dial up internet. But that definition has actually evolved. It's not just a matter of if, if you have access to technology, it's a matter of can you afford to use it to its full capacity, uh, most notably you know, can you afford high-speed internet, as well as are you comfortable with technology? So it's access, it's finances, as well as it's comfort with technology, and that certainly does not, is not limited to just socioeconomic status. One thing that jumps out on this graph, at least to me, is you might see um, most people have smartphones, and you might think, well, I hear this sometimes, well, why do low-income people have smartphones? That's another conversation for another day. Um, the reality is that that's the only thing that you can find in the store. If you want to buy a cell phone, it is 
you know, it's going to be a smartphone. So there's challenges to that, depending on the, the capabilities and access that the citizens that we engage with have or the, the residents. However, there's certainly opportunities to still engage with those populations. Um, who can be left out if we go just purely online, if we're not thoughtful about mixing the two together? Um, racial and ethnic marginalized populations or seasoned citizens, as I like to refer them. Um, as well as the disabled members of the disabled community. So we have to be thoughtful about that as we consider um, a blend of our different engagement approaches. Here is a quote from the Reverend T.D. Jakes, and I will read this aloud. America is rethinking itself. It's reshaping itself. It's honoring people that it ignored. It's hearing people that were, we were once deaf to. A lot of times quotes are taken out of context. This one was actually specifically uh, mentioning the COVID pandemic, as well as the what I call the most recent racial awakening. Uh, the pandemic itself, uh, pandemic is going to do what a pandemic does. It was really sheer trauma that a lot of people experienced. Um, some more so than others, some communities more so than others, as well as, uh, you know, kind of makes sense, the, uh, the racial awakening as well. I think those are what really elevated uh, the newfound kind of attention to the, the interest in how we engage communities. And again, some options that may have always been on the table, um, but didn't get as much attention because certain communities didn't initially get as much attention. So here's what I am proposing as the new rules of engagement. This is my definition of equity. Um, equity equals accountability and sustained effort. It's a very popular uh, word that's going on, uh, going around. Equity is an outcome. It requires intentionality. It requires owning up to certain things and it requires sustained effort. It's not a one and done thing. That's something to be very mindful of as we engage with uh, different communities. Synchronous and asynchronous engagement um, that's really how I think of what's traditionally called in-person and online engagement. Synchronous, and I borrow this uh, somewhat from the education community, means real-time engagement. Again, that's nothing new. It's something that was always on the table, be it an in-person activity. Um, you can do, uh, of course, what we're doing now, a real-time activity when it comes to being online. So um, that's how I think there's more accurate way of, of uh, uh, categorizing the work, if you will. And then asynchronous means, you know, pretty much on demand. We live in an on, de uh, on, uh, on de demand um, uh, society now. So, you know, that's always something that's been on the table as well. Traditionally surveys or what have you, you can also do virtual engagement on demand. So I, I really encourage our community to think of um, engagement in those kind of uh, uh, terms as opposed to necessarily just online or in person because the, quite honestly, you can blend those together and they would fall within the synchronous and asynchronous categories of engagement. And embrace and invest in technology. That is for my public sector friends. That is also for my fellow consultants and that's for organizational leaders. It's no longer a luxury, it's no longer an add-on, it's no longer something that's nice to have. It is a necessity. One thing that was funny is, you know, back in uh, March and early April, one reason we had a lot of Zoom fatigue is because a lot of people were, you know, they didn't want to cough up the 10, the 10 bucks for Zoom, so they were having the 30 and 45 minute meetings. You know, the, the pandemic is not a passing storm for one. It was going to be around for a while and, you know, have some skin in the game. Let, let's, let's really do what's needed to do this work. Um, and, you know, particularly as, as I referenced the communities that can really stand to, to benefit from it. Um, last but not least, I truly thank you all for what you do. We all are important drops in that mighty ocean. Um, I am passionate, I believe, in the work that, that we do in the various ways and it is needed for all of our communities just for a better world, better society, and uh, keep, keep doing what you're doing. And this, that's my contact information. Um, we'll, I think, drop it in the chat as well. Would love to find out more about your work, um, what you do, and I'm a, a constant learner and very passionate about this work. Um, thank you for, for your attention. Thank you again for the invita invitation to participate in this uh, very, very uh, exciting event.
Thank you so much, Kobe. That was fantastic. So we are going to jump into a breakout. You're going to be in pairs. I might be a couple of you who are in a three, a, um, a triad. And we want to hear about where you're from and specifically what brought you here tonight. So um, Pooja, are we ready to dive right in? Get folks yes. chatting with each other? <laughs> so Michael, are you ready to send us off? Yep. And just to confirm, it'll be 10 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, we'll be good to go. Uh, you guys will be launched in in just a second. See you in 10 minutes, everyone. Have fun. With that, Sarah, would you like to introduce our next speaker? Let me spotlight you and we can take it from there. Thank you so much, Pooja. And I got to say, Jason, that is some beard you grew. I haven't seen you in such a long time. Um, okay, our next speaker, I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Miguel. Um, I admire his work so much and he's so articulate. I'm thrilled that you're with us. Let you- um, Hey, uh, go ahead. Hello everyone. Um, unfortunately, I will be off video today. Thank you so much uh, for introducing me today. And it's funny that you say he grew a beard. I lost one. But uh, anyways, uh, yeah, I'm here today and uh, I want to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to speak to you guys about digital engagement and what we do here. So I'm, uh, my name is Miguel Alatorre and I work with Green Action for Health and Environmental Justice um, out of the Central Valley in uh, Kettleman City, California. And so uh, digital engagement became a really big part uh, of our work uh, in our community, especially when, we, when it came to the pandemic that uh, unfortunately kind of drove us to have to uh, communicate to our communities in this means. So uh, fortunately enough, I had actually been doing some work uh, with Zoom and uh, with the community with Zoom before the pandemic happened. And so uh, we actually learned a lot of tools and a lot of things that we put into use uh, in our engagement um, today. And so one of the biggest things that uh, Green Action works on is our youth academies. And so our youth academies are these academies where we put on environmental justice youth academies to teach um, the children in Kettleman. And, and sometimes it's not just children, but usually we do um, age ranges from 12 to 21. And so we'll invite about 10 um, people to uh, these engagement classes. And uh, we use Zoom as a tool to teach them um, when, it's safe to, when it's not safe to meet up physically. And so that was, uh, uh, it unfortunately happened all last year uh, we were never able to meet up physically. So we use Zoom and uh, we found out a lot of uh, new ways to engage um, that this type of audience specifically because, um, you know, nowadays a lot of people use social media, especially um, the younger generation. So they're really big on learning things very quickly and in a very short and condensed format. And so uh, we learned along the way that there are a lot of tools and add-ons that you can use uh, inside of Zoom meetings um, in order to generate more participation, because we all know those times where there's like that awkward silence on Zoom, uh, no one knows what to say, and everyone's kind of staring at each other. And so uh, we wanted to change that up. And um, especially when we're talking about uh, younger groups of children, and you know, they, they suffer from Zoom burnout, um, just as much as us adults do. Um, I know myself, I spend um, eight hours a day, sometimes 10 hours a day on Zooms. And so with that taken into consideration, um, the way we spiced up our Zooms is by using tools such as uh, Kahoot. I don't know if uh, anyone on this meeting, if you guys uh, have ever used Kahoot, you guys can go ahead and put it in the chat. But uh, Kahoot is a tool that you can use. It's free for so many people. Um, fortunately enough, we have a very small group. Um, so we do get to use Kahoot for free. Um, but it's a way that we get to interact with this type of audience that really gets them um, into the Zoom because a lot of the times um, we tend to put Zooms on in the background and and I know it's kind of bad to do but you know they, we're talking about kids who spend eight hours a day at school um, they get tired of the Zoom stuff real quick you know pretty quickly um, especially since they do spend so much time behind the screen and so uh, we have been setting up all our cyber presentations um, in a means that's really digestible in an online format and also um, trying to do it so that anyone can join. So one of the really big things that uh, Green Action found out quickly is not everyone has technology 
um, not everyone has access or means to be able to go out and buy the latest and greatest laptop or uh, the best um, internet connection. And especially in the Central Valley here, we're very limited um, in terms of what internet providers we can get. Um, so Green Action had some seed money and we put it together and we were able to get um, some of those community members that required it, um, internet boxes, um, portable hotspots, so they can use that to um, successfully connect um, to our Zooms. And so uh, it's been a real challenge in terms of connecting our audience when it comes to technology, but these are some barriers that we've uh, thankfully been able to overcome um, due to the grants that Green Action gets. And so um, we are lucky in that fact, but everyone that's done our uh, Cyber Academy, they actually go through it and they say, you know, half of the time um, they prefer it to the real deal. Uh, a lot of people kind of get stage fright when it comes to uh, being in a physical spot and uh, having to talk someone, talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. And so uh, sometimes this uh, online format, it allows us to reach, you know, certain people or uh, kids that we would have never reached before due to the fact that uh, they're uncomfortable speaking in public or they're uncomfortable speaking in front of such a big audience. And so it's a tool that's allowed us to reach a lot more people than we usually would. Uh, another um, way that we use uh, cyber engagement in our community is that um, we've been putting on virtual community forums um, where we speak about issues that plague the town and uh, get community members involved in uh, making a difference. So for example, in, uh, in Avenal, California, they have a municipal waste landfill that is uh, literally in the yard of, of some people and uh, it is a really big nuisance. And so we've put on uh, successful community forums with the local EJ partners there. And uh, again, um, the cyber format can be tricky um, when it comes to getting people the technology, but um, those of us that do have the means, um, we communicated with those that didn't, and we were able to get uh, people on Zoom by kind of uh, getting them to a safe location together so they can all beam each other to Zoom. And we were able to have a, a really successful uh, community forum in Avenal where we discussed um, all the issues that were plaguing the residents and we helped them uh, make complaints and uh, get some change to their community because it was very much being impacted um, by that. Um, so I don't want to keep rambling and rambling, but I would like to take any questions that anyone has um, on cyber engagement specifically uh, in terms of challenges or anything that you guys would like to hear. Um, I'm all open to uh, questions. Thanks so much, Miguel. So I see in the chat, I'm sorry, I see in the chat, I had a question. Um, how did we use Kahoot? Um, so we would use Kahoot um, depending on the program that we're doing. Um, so like sometimes I would plug in the acronyms to the organizations that we were dealing with. So for example, um, not everyone is familiar at that age with what um, the EPA stands for or what DTSC stands for. So um, we would create quizzes that would help them um, to put together those acronyms with the proper organizations. And uh, Kahoot helps because it, it is colorful. It is a good format to use uh, when you're dealing with school age children. And sometimes even the adults get a kick out of it because uh, I would do uh, presentations with uh, other uh, adult organizations and we'd use those Kahoots to put together programs that would kind of um, get at specific topics. So like we did a Kahoot specifically on cyber engagement. Oh. And uh, we you used um, Kahoot to kind of uh, explain some of the tools that we use uh, for cyber engagement. So that's that question. Should I read this question um, from Rachel? How do yeah, you pair? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, no, how do you pair non-cyber engagement with digital tools if there is not capability for all to engage using digital slash cyber means? That's a really, really good question. So recently um, we did a community forum in uh, Kettleman City and um, it was a health fair. Um, and so we kind of had a, a task that we didn't have before, which is doing a dual um, kind of engagement because um, our uh, grant says that we have to do um, that specific program um, physically 
But, you know, with the whole pandemic going on, we also didn't want to compromise the health of our residents. And so um, what we did was we rented out the local community center. And, of course, we got the word out to the community. And we marked um, every space in there, of course, six feet apart and did our booth six feet apart and made sure everyone was masked and social distanced. But in order to engage the community in an online format as well where they could participate, um, we definitely made sure um, to use um, the social media that was appropriate for the community. So in our case, it was uh, most definitely Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram. And so we use those and we go live. And uh, even some of these Zooms that we uh, participate in, <clears throat> we tend to put them on Facebook Live um, to gather a bigger audience and a bigger following. And it also helps your physical events um, to integrate those social media moments because uh, nowadays um, it is so easy to insert a link or um, copy and paste something into uh, different browsers or different forms of media. Uh, most phones do have uh, the capability to take things online. And so we can easily create a link and uh, get people on those events in an online format as well as physically. Nice. Okay, so we're almost out of time, but um, one other question has to do with hotspots. And I'm wondering as you're answering that, for those who work in government, um, might you want to emphasize the importance of connecting with local folks on the ground like you? Uh, yeah, I will take a, a question on those hotspots. Uh, thank you. And uh, in terms of the hotspots, we were able to garner funds ourselves, um, you know, in, internally through Green Action. It's, it's not necessarily a grant, but nowadays, uh, if you're part of an organization, um, and you know they give you the money for outreach or you know however uh, you can. Just remember when you're writing these grants that realistically um, you will need some money for technology if your grant allows. And so that's kind of what we do nowadays is as we're looking for the grants that we look for in order to help our community, we look for some that are practical in terms of um, how can we uh, do cyber outreach effectively. Um, and it, unfortunately it does take money, you know, uh, and it doesn't grow on trees. So um, you have to kind of point your program in a way where you can get those tools out to your community. And so that's, uh, that's what, the, what I would uh, recommend. Great. So as you wrap up, any last plug about partnering with local on the ground folks like yourself? Um, in terms of partnering with us, um, I think just be respectful of the community you're uh, entering to and the, the people that, you know, do work in there. Like, for example, there's some people that reach out to the town of, uh, I do business in which Kettleman City, California. And a lot of the times their programs are specifically designed in the English language. And uh, they don't do any like uh, research prep to figure out that we're predominantly 99% uh, uh, Latino population. And so um, just do your homework and research uh, on the community that you're gonna work in before um, you reach out to people. And uh, to close it off, uh, just thank you so much, Sarah, for inviting me. And uh, thank you, everyone else, for giving me the, the time and the spot to speak. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, that was so helpful. All right, Rebecca, are you ready to go? Hi, everyone. I am. Let me just share my screen. And make sure I have what I need. Can everyone see my screen? Looks great. Perfect. Okay, well, everyone has made incredible points today. So I am here to wrap all of that up and talk about technology in particular. I'm so happy that Kobe and Miguel um, you know, really discussed accessibility as that's an assumption we've made um, by presenting a hybrid model um, at the get go. So, you know, keeping that in mind, um, just like it's already been reinforced, I encourage you to think about as we discuss some of these tech options, um, what are your best practices uh, that you would use in person and you're trying to create an equitable experience uh, through this hybrid model. So we'll, we'll touch on that and I encourage you to leave questions in the chat. And of course, we will be having the opportunity to have a group discussion after the fact. So real fast, uh, my name is Rebecca Gamilla. I'm the founder of Right and Good Consulting. I have a lot of alignment and um, what I provide. Um, 
uh, with Kobe, I work in the strategic communication space for responsible organizations and feel really passionately about public participation. So um, my background is with municipal governments as well as uh, nonprofit organizations and the participation and partnership model in between the two. Um, real quick, our agenda today, um, everyone has had, you know, a brief amount of time to give you a lot of tight uh, necessary info, but, you know, I want to just remind you um, that I read the comments that several of you provided uh, during your registration and I saw a lot of complaints um, about the hybrid model. So we're going to talk about why you all think that's a problem and why um, I heartily disagree while we try to address all of the concerns that have already been mentioned today. Uh, why hybrid is the answer and will be the answer moving forward, the tech solutions that I would recommend, and of course, as I mentioned, the opportunity for us to have a discussion at the end. So what's the problem? Um, you know, we all want to know the tools, but at the end of the day, this is still about relationship building. This is still about public participation. Um, as a communications professional, I really equate the anxiety that's happening right now around the hybrid problem to almost the emergence of other new technology that I've seen um, in my career and lifetime. So, you know, uh, think about the uh, narrative that was taking place five plus years ago when social media really hit peak mainstream. Um, like Kobe mentioned, the fact that you can't even buy a cell phone now without it being a smartphone, how that was something that was unheard of um, seven or eight years ago. And, and ultimately people adapted. So I really look at the hybrid model that you're all here to discuss as simply a tool to enhance your current experience and your current public participation methods. Um, if you have a college age student or a student in the classroom, they have all been experiencing this hybrid model. Um, Kobe talked about synchronous and asynchronous learning and, and really ultimately what's difficult about hybrid and why it's often labeled as the bad guy is because uh, for the busy and harried professional, you have to plan more and, and do more work on the front end, which is realistically a stretch um, when you're overworked. You also have to appeal to people who may not be familiar with technology and there might be troubleshooting required, which means additional training and resources. And then on top of this, you're trying to create a comparable experience for someone who's in the room and who's not in the room and create relevancy for them so that they can come to this conversation and speak about the same topic and provide opinions from a relative space of, of understanding. So that's a lot to ask moving forward. But I'm here to say that there are a lot of advantages, so we won't harp on these, but I want you to really think about when you have a great meeting, when you have a great community conversation, um, we all look for that relationship building, but participation is there. Um, some other advantages of virtual events, especially if you're really needing to uh, put together a grant or create ROI or sell a virtual or hybrid event idea to someone on your team who may be so ready to get back to in-person and can't wait until we never use a hybrid model again. Think about the advantages of what a virtual event can bring to your experience, especially if you do implement a hybrid model. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of consultants registered and told me that they were doing this regularly. Um, also the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency seems to have had really great experience uh, tapping into a hybrid model with their own meetings. So I really recommend you check that out. Their scalability, increased opportunities for participation, which Miguel mentioned, of course, we're always looking to bring in diversity and accessibility. Um, you'll note that we have transcription notes on this event for those that would prefer to read or, or have better reading capabilities. You're getting a higher cost of efficiency because of the tech at large. And at the end of the day, it's a more sustainable option. It helps you build community before and after the events. You have continued reach. And last but not least, you have access to data. Um, that can be scary, but also it means that you can understand what worked and what didn't. You can take that information and build off of that, create community dashboards, community events, and other opportunities to continue the conversation. So at the end of the day, we all understand the hybrid event strategy. What are they really? There's a physical and online component. There's equal access to all attendees. 
and you have created an equal experience for attendees, no matter where they tune in from. I think all of us have said that in different ways, but what's important to remember is not one is better than the other. Uh, for trained communications professionals and facilitators, you know, it's entirely possible that you have one experience in more areas, but at the end of the day, you're here to bring this conversation to as many people as possible. And if you can use a hybrid method to do so, then that's really valuable. Um, I saw that the Santa Clara Valley Water District is hosting their first hybrid event tomorrow. Several of you um, indicated that you actually have strong demand for hybrid events moving forward. I think Flash Vote referenced that. So, you know, what I'm learning from some of the comments that you've provided in your registration is actually that while it's a little bit of a struggle on the front end, your participants are actually uh, more satisfied with the experience that they've had when they have hybrid opportunities. Hybrid does not just mean us on this Zoom. We had a limited amount of time, resources, and capacity to bring a statewide conversation to you. But perhaps this is a community meeting where um, Sarah presented in person. We filmed and recorded that. The City of LA Mayor's Office does an excellent job of getting onto a live stream and filming what's happening in person and then displaying that online for on-demand results and participation. These are all great examples. Just really quickly, if I didn't say it enough, uh, virtual events are here to stay. Hybrid events are here to stay. And it's the new and improved normal. So we're about to get into the tech tools itself um, because while you may have sat here expectantly waiting for a list of, of technologies to look at, at the end of the day, you need tools that work for you. I loved how both Kobe and Miguel talked about accessibility and how, you know, Zoom has a lot of free tools already incorporated, or perhaps you have the basic paid plan. Are you investing in tools that will help get the job done through organization, storage, planning, your event plan form? At the end of the day, you're going to have to go through an RFP. You may or may not get a free tool based on the technology. It may or may not be an enterprise customization that works for you. So you are going to have to test platforms. I can only give you ideas of what those are. But what you want to make sure is that your new and improved normal looks like something that will actually create change within your organization and be adapted as much as within your organization as it is with the audiences that you're trying to communicate with. You can also do this through improving your process. Um, just like all of the best practices that we've all learned through different IAP2, Davenport, and, and public engagement trainings, um, you're here to amplify the technology, to amplify the conversation. So you want to create community expectations, routines, conversations, and community uh, when you use this hybrid model. As someone presenting in person and able to do breakout rooms, you have a dynamic use of time and space with the hybrid model. We're doing that today by breaking out using interactive tools to create group dashboards, shared visuals, shared resources, and I shared a few tech tools here as well. A little extra planning also goes you know, a long way. Um, you wanna make sure that you ask uh, questions, you incorporate everyone, you provide physical and digital worksheets, notes and agendas, and, and again, I can't emphasize this enough. You're really just using the technology that is the most likely to be adapted and most likely to be used. That's often the simplest. Um, what email provider does your IT team use? What social media are you allowed to share on? What documents can you put in the cloud or online? Um, many of our tools need to be accessible for FOIA. You need to make sure that they're available for ADA compliance, translation, and all of those things that we already look for when we're looking to publicly participate in an equitable and ethical way, you wanna do this as well. So to be cognizant of time, um, I'm gonna hop forward um, to some tools, but I wanted to just you know, continue emphasizing these things about personalization that can really bring a greater amount of participation and engagement, which ultimately leads to satisfaction. Um, some of the examples provided here were spoken about earlier today, as well as syncing again, the in-person and at-home experience. You can never communicate enough. You can never create enough expectations. You can never do enough pre-event opportunities. Um, 
you want to be as interactive as possible, but also as um, as central as possible. And that if you're not answering fundamental questions and providing fundamental accessibility, um, you are not going to get your message across. And for those that are there in person or those that you're following up with, um, this is gonna be essential. So we'll hop straight in. We've got some tools we recommend. And as a reminder, we'll share these slides. I was trying to find a compelling visual way uh, to share this with you. So I actually have a few slides. Um, this is probably the bucket that everyone is most familiar with. These are you know, web conferencing and meeting tools. So you know, even knowing the difference, what is a webinar where you're presenting, sharing information out? We could have used that option today, but we used actually a meeting so that we could have these breakouts, we could have discussions, we could have engagement. Um, you know, are you live streaming these events on social media? Um, we're always thinking social tools and technology, but what about public access cable, radio, um, other distribution methods uh, to these tools as well? You wanna think like a business and think about the tools that you already have, think about what's approved by your IT team, think about what grants you're writing and the technology that you're asking for to have these conversations. Uh, we also have meeting schedulers. This again is a little bit different than a webinar. Sometimes you, most of the time, you pick an event and you move forward. But what if you're having community meetings, council meetings, um, the variety of meetings that we are all having day to day, in addition to your teamwork and internal communication, maybe you could have a reasonably effective poll to see what times are most accessible and use some of the automations that are here for follow-up sessions. And then last but not least, you know, a ton of interactivity tools. Um, we've also got things like Google Docs, polls, budget tools, forum, q and I know um, flash votes on here, uh, open gov metrics. We mentioned Kahoot's earlier, story maps. These are all different platforms to allow you to interact with your audience like you would in the room, enhanced by technology, not replacing. Because again, at the end of the day, we're here to have an equitable conversation. So to wrap this up, I just want to remind you that technology is your friend. It is not a replacement. It's also here to stay. And after you go through all of that work of planning, stressing about if everyone's sound works, if their screen works, if the person in the room has enough lighting and they're able to hear in the back of the auditorium, as well as be live streamed on Facebook, all of those things can be delegated, should be practiced and should be accommodated and planned for because they're not going away. But the show isn't over. And that's what we wanna remind you. The conversation and hybrid model is enhancing an ongoing relationship and engagement that begins pre-event through all of the materials and lead up emails and post-event through your follow-up. Are you analyzing again, the data and the metrics of those that have attended and then tweaking, make sure you poll, make sure that you ask questions and make sure that if someone is giving you strong advice that you're moving forward from there. So uh, crammed a lot in a really short amount of time. Uh, you'll get this, but I have some great references that actually go into great detail about a lot of these tools that you'll be able to link to and provide. As always, we all know you can ask questions in the chat and follow up with me as well. You can also find me on LinkedIn on my website at writeandgood.com. And I will hand this over to Pooja for what happens next. We're now gonna take these tools, this hybrid model, and we're gonna have a conversation in person. And thank you so much. Thank you. Um, would you mind taking down your screen share so I can hop in the screen share? Yes. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So I will be introducing us for the larger part of our discussion breakout. As you noticed from the chat, there's a lot we can learn from each other. In fact, perhaps you can learn more from each other than you can learn from our speakers. With that in mind and practicing what we preach, we will be going into a longer discussion breakout, which will give you the opportunity to discuss different approaches to public engagement. I'm going to move to a slide that has the instructions for this breakout, but please don't worry that you need to write every single thing down. I'm going to share the link for this slide deck in a moment. So with that, let's go into some quick instructions. You're going to receive a prompt to join a breakout session. Our breakout master, Michael, will send you off in a moment. You will have access to this slide deck, which I will drop into the chat in a moment. 
and it has labeled slides, as you can see, room one, room two, room three, so on and so forth. In your breakouts, you will be working, uh, taking notes for your discussion on your respective slides. Your room number can, uh, corresponds to your slide number. Please, when you enter into your group, select Describe. This is it, you don't need great handwriting because you're typing it, so don't worry if you feel shy about your handwriting. Please select Describe in your group to capture highlights of your discussion on your respective Google slide. A PDF of, of these slides will be available to be shared with everybody in the follow-up email, so fret not. And now this is what you're going to be talking about. I know you're all waiting for this part. Where are you at now? How have you been thinking about the topic of hybrid public engagement? Is your organizing organization utilizing any of these tools or trends? Are you seeing challenges? Are you seeing some successes? I saw a few things pop into the chat. This is a place to capture them in your discussions. So again, you will have these slides. I will drop that link in in a moment as Michael's preparing breakouts and you will take notes capturing the content of your conversation highlights. Does it need to be a transcript in your respective Google slides to help you out? because I noticed this issue last time, you will see me hopping into your breakouts. And I did this motion. Yes, I did that with my hands. I will hop into your breakouts to see and make sure everything is going well. Okay, so with that, Michael, you will prepare breakouts while I drop a Google link into the chat. So that Google presentation link is a link to this presentation. So you have access to hop in and take notes. I see, oh my, a lot of people are already popping in. Great, this is working. Fantastic. So I'm going to stop share. Michael, are we ready to go? Oh, Michael, you're muted. You will be <laughs> predominantly four, and we have a um, odd number, so we're going to break out and see how it goes. Um, wow, what a great session. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Deanna DeSatis, and I'm Communications Director at the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. Um, and this was such a great session. And uh, my colleagues and I just wanted to wrap up really, quite frankly, to say thank you to everyone for attending the event, um, the future of public engagement in a hybrid world, which really has so much more meaning now that I've heard Rebecca. Um, and this event was really a product of a, a really great collaborative approach and partnership between the Davenport Institute, um, Cal ICMA, ELGL, IAP2, USA, and ILG. Talk about a lot of acronyms. <laughs> but it was really a great collaborative effort. We all got together and really wanted to do this, and I'm so glad that we did. Um, and you, just letting you know that looking ahead, you're going to be hearing from us with a follow-up email. Um, that has a feedback survey on the event, as well as some of the links to all of the partner organizations that I've just mentioned that participated with you today. Um, you'll also be receiving, um, you'll be hearing from our partner, Right Plus Good, in the near future, as well as the Davenport uh, Institute will be sending you their monthly newsletter. And lastly, if you are interested in, <clears throat> um, hello? Oh, sorry. And lastly, if you're interested at all, also in finding more about IAP2 USA, I'm actually an IAP2 USA board member, proud on my fifth year of being a board member. We're gonna make sure information about our organization and our chapters that are located throughout the, all over the country, um, that information will also be included in that, that information that you're going to be getting. So all we wanna say now is thank you so much. Um, if any of my colleagues would like to step in for the last minute and say anything, some final word, words, you're more than happy to do so, free to do so. I mean, quickly to say, you will also get a PDF of all the work that you did in the yeah. breakouts. So that will not be lost, it's captured and you will get it as an opportunity to learn from each other. We love sharing information. <laughs> yeah, so I think, I think we're in good shape. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your, appreciate your participation. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you Take to care. everybody. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.